there's always this period of, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you, right. can you hear me? And then there's the, uh, the, the drop after, can you hear me? Where everyone's quiet, you know? <laughs> I just did it with my brother, but I got to go to his house because I'm in Wichita right now. Oh, cool. I'm uh, waiting for my check to come from student loans. That was my, they took my federal uh, return. It's going to my mother's. So as soon as I get that in my hand, I'm heading back. Oh, cool. And I've given up on glasses. <laughs> Drinking straight out of the giant jug of <laughs> Yeah. It's pretty, I mean, it got low enough. When it's full, it's too heavy. Yeah, I, um, I gave up on, I got tired of doing dishes, so I bought a bunch of paper plates yep. at the store, but I've also started running out of food, so now I'm on the soup section of my menu, so you can't really eat soup with paper plates. No. Bad for the environment, Matt. Just watch I know, I know, but the good news is I can't even use them now. <laughs> being lazy and wash your fucking dishes no it's been like six times a day now <laughs> i got things to do oh my god no it's not that bad <laughs> not that bad you'll be all right you could wash a dish yeah you got i have been six times a day <laughs> you have things to do i mean i know you work but i think you have time you would think that I have time to wash the dishes here. There are three people here right now. You kind of yeah. take turns. They're well, a little I also have been trying to get better at cooking bigger meals, so that way I'm not cooking three times a day either. Yeah. Well, I was doing that. Yeah. Mostly because I was just trying to stretch my money for food, and so I would make like a big batch of like chicken Alfredo, and then just eat it for like the next five meals. Yeah. In little containers. And then until I made a new batch of something new, and then I got to eat a different food. Uh, I had snacks and stuff, but then I got I got the foodie stamps. Mm, there we go. Now, and I'm here, and so like I don't have to do all the cooking and cleaning. So I I can eat different food every day. It's amazing. But that's gonna end soon. And I'm just going to get a lot of individual meals. I can't. Yeah. I don't want to cook. Um, <laughs> and the individual meals, it's a waste because of their container, but you just throw them away. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> it's over. It's all. Right. But I, uh, I don't know. I've just been really lazy lately. I feel you. The last few days I just I don't know if I'm like depressed I don't feel sad or anything I'm just like just don't care yeah I just don't care I think I got overloaded with stress and anxiety to the point where I just like stopped caring about everything totally yeah I um I feel like you know I haven't been using the word depressed I've been using the word disengaged you know, and that really feels like more how I feel of like, I feel like I'm just always like 10 feet away from everything I'm working on. And even though I'm still working, it's just like, there's a general fog in my mind and mm -hmm. stuff. And I think it's happening across the board. Yeah, it's just like, I don't want to do anything. It's, yeah, it's like being stuck in the first gear is how I've thought of it. Like, I'm used to being able to drive in, like, second gear, third gear, fourth gear, and now it's just like, all right, you get to stay under 10 miles an hour at all times. <laughs> yeah. I don't have anything to do. I I need to do more editing of the, of the podcast, but they're kind of building up now. But I'm doing so many of them. I'm doing, like, two, three a day. Whoa, cool. And so that's a lot. And then these ones, just to warn you, I'm not editing at all. So anything that's said is getting slapped upon the internet eventually under the fat, lonely bitch. I'm not editing it. Uh, all right. So paper plates, I'm going to be coming under, under huge fire for that. Is that what you're telling me? I don't know. 
No one's going to listen to this, probably. <laughs> what are you talking about? I will. <laughs> well, go listen to your own, and if you want to bitch at yourself about paper right. plates, that's your prerogative, man. Um, um, well, honestly, yeah, if you're down with just posting stuff, more power to you, because I think a lot of us get stuck in post-production, and well, people are just more open and welcoming than we realize you know i did that in with a podcast before and then no one listened to it and i was like that was a lot of work for nothing mm. but my art of comedy one uh the other one i'm doing interviews for i am editing it and i want to make sure that i don't really care about cuss words and stuff but i want to make sure it stays on topic you know and i end up just chit-chatting with people and it's still interesting conversation to get their background information and, and and they've been great conversations and i've really connected with a lot of like female comics it's been amazing but i don't need all that for art of comedy it's it's got specific things that it's about it has a purpose and a a use and it needs to be you know i cut out the ums and the oh yeah the pauses and all that to get it as concise as possible. I still don't have like intro music or any of that or a real hugely set format because I, mm -hmm. I don't want it to be like clinical. Mm -hmm. I want to ask them questions, get information, but I don't want it to be clinical. Right. Because it's yeah. how, how comedy has helped them. And basically like I don't have students that have gone through classes that the nonprofits put them through. So I don't have testimonials in that way to show that this is a good program that people should donate money to. So I'm just gathering basically testimonials from female comedians and queer comedians about how comedy has helped them and how they think this could help other people. So that's, that's the purpose, but I do chit chat a lot with, uh, then one, I had a very in-depth conversation about accounting and the history of accounting. No, oh, that's niche. Yeah, she's a comedian and an accountant. I love it. There's a, so few of us that have those, the struggle of the two brains. Right, right. Uh, yeah, so um, she was a great one to interview, though, because she's actually taken the class from Christy. So, Christy Buckley, so. Yeah. And then, yeah, it's it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, you need people to go through the program to get the testimonials to get the money, but people aren't really joining the program till there's money. Yeah, because and it's like I I think of it in my own way that uh, the way I have my Patreon, it's like, um, yeah, it's like I either have like money or time or content, and I'm not in a place right now where I can have all three, so I either need to like put more content and more time into it and then the money will come or save up money and then put out I content. need to figure out Patreon. I haven't figured it out. I haven't, I haven't figured it out yet. Um, yeah. I tried to, but I need to, I mean, I really, I'm getting the nonprofit ready as far as I can, but I mean, there are classes being taught online. So eventually I might have to just, put someone through the class online mm -hmm. but I really don't want to I want them to do it in person I want them to be able to go to Mike's afterwards I want to be able right. to watch them <laughs> <laughs> right. make them I'll laugh the camera. <laughs> yeah. right, that's right. my girl yeah, yeah. Um, all they see is a glow of the cigar from the back of the room <laughs> You're doing a great job. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, I think it can work. I mean, I'm investing my own money at this point. I got some donations for the filing fee. Um, it's not officially a nonprofit to where it's tax deductible yet. So I'm, that's the whole reason I started a nonprofit was because I was doing the Art of Comedy Female Festival and I just wanted to basically make the festival nonprofit and, and raise money um, just to do the festival. I really, like this money would go into next year's festival. I really wasn't planning to, you know, and the festival was about bringing women together and helping them network. And then it was just like, I could start a nonprofit and then it was like, if I'm going to start a nonprofit, 
the fundraiser, the festival would just be the fundraiser. Cause I got connected with this woman that I was doing some work for her, um, for nonprofit go is the name of her nonprofit. And she does accounting for nonprofits and she works in Wichita at like the, one of the theaters or something like that, that is a nonprofit. And so she's given me a lot of advice on starting a nonprofit. And she was, that's what she was. She was like, the festival could be a fundraiser for the nonprofit, but there, there needs to be, what is your benefit to society? Basically you have to have a benefit to society. And, and I was like empowering women. And she's like, that's not enough. And I was like, damn it. Okay. Um, so I will, you know, use the money to teach women comedy. And then I was like, added in the LGBTQIA community. And then she suggested troubled youth because you get a lot of grants for kids. And I was Mm. like, I guess I'll help the children. Right. (laughs) Yeah. You're like, fine. You get in here too. You're also othered. (laughs) They're kind of the others. I mean, some of them will be. Yeah. Well, you know, so um, it's it's interesting because so I joined something called Comedy Business School like not too long ago. Um, And part of it was uh, there's just like a really big Facebook group of all the other people who have like joined this course. Right. Mm -hmm. And I was like, man, I want a place for them to hang out where so I called it like comedy cafeteria, right? So it was the idea that whoever I kind of want to talk to there um, can have a space, you know? But I kind of don't want it to just be open because if you could imagine, there's also a lot of pretty obnoxious, like white straight comic guys that joined Mm -hmm. in that course too. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, no surprise. So then I was like, okay, so maybe it should be called like queer comedy cafeteria. And then I was thinking like, okay, so then it'll be more of like a specialized place, you yeah. know? But then I don't want to like, uh, as a man, I don't want to be like, you know, inviting other like women in the group and being like, hey, you're othered. Why don't you come on in? Because that seems like condescending. So yeah. I've like, just like, I'm like, ah, I don't know. What do you think? Do you have any advice on this or perspective? It's really hard. Um, yeah, because like the festival I do, it's the art of female comedy, but I also want non-binary people to apply. And I couldn't think of a really good name for it. Mm -hmm. And then, so I was like, I'll do a separate festival that's maybe two days for the queer community. And I call the, I say the queer community just to envelop everybody, but there are some people in the community that do not like being called queer. So, um, I, I was just going to have the art of queer comedy, but there are people that don't like being called queer, but there's queer festivals. Right. Yeah. So that's probably what I'll have to call that. But, um, I mean, if you're wanting to include women who are not queer, um, and have one group for everybody. Yeah. It's really hard. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because it has to be open enough that anyone can join, but it also has to be safe enough that people feel comfortable there. And yeah. with a lot of these, like, Facebook comedy writing groups I'm a part of, it's just, you know, these, like, some of these jokes that people are telling, I'm like, oh, that's, like, not cool. You know, it's, like, kind yeah. of offensive. There's still a lot of people that are, like, offensive humor is in, and I'm just like, oh yeah, it's really not. Like, I mean... Um, it is I think not like, in Denver, but it is in other areas. Come to Wichita. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if maybe it's just because I've exposed my brain to a lot, but it's rarely shocking, you know? <laughs> you know? It's not that the comedians here are in the club of wanting to be shocking. It's really, it's not them, but the audience here is, it would be okay with that kind of humor. Yeah. The non-PC, speak your mind. Right. Um, they really like it if you have a puppet or you're a hypnotist or you have a guitar. They need some sort of some sort of gimmick for their comedy. Interesting. <laughs> for the most part. Um, wow. I never thought someone would need a puppet, you know? <laughs> those are the acts that sell out the loony bin. There you go. That's all I know. Which I'm not saying it's bad. There's a place for that comedy. 
you know? Yeah. And that's the loony bin in Wichita, Kansas, or Little Rock, Arkansas, or Tulsa, or Oklahoma City. That's where that belongs. That's what I told yeah. the comedians this summer when I was in this big fucking online and in-person debate about political correct comedy and stuff. And I was like, if you think, you know, if you think that there's an audience for it, go produce your own show. Go produce mm-hmm. your own mic where you can put people up in whatever order you want and you can do it the way you want everyone. You're telling everyone else they need to do it. Then go do it and see if you get butts in seats. I don't think you will here, not in Denver, maybe yeah. go up to Fort Collins or Greeley or something, but the, the audiences here don't want that kind of humor. And that's what we're here for is to entertain our audiences and producers and venues want butts in seats and mm-hmm. that are happy butts and leave with a good taste in their mouth and want to come back. Um, right. So you can't just force your shitty comedy onto them that they're not going to like. If you think yeah. there's an audience, you swear there's an audience, you swear there's people that want to hear it, go find that audience, build that audience, because it's not, you're trying to force yourself into something that doesn't want you. Yeah. Well, I also think it's important, too, that, you know, like, people also got to be willing to stand by their joke and their post and their art, and that's the standard I hold myself up to, where it's like, Anything I put out in the world, I will gladly like defend because I know that it's like true or right, you know? And there's stuff I've made in the past that maybe I wouldn't totally defend, but it's just like, I don't know. I'm not going to take it down or anything, you know? I, I Thankfully, I did not have the internet available to me when I was ignorant Right. To post anything. So I have no record of my ignorance. <laughs> Lucky. I, I also got got to the aim of posting late too so yeah how old are you i am 32 yeah i turned 32 yeah like a couple weeks ago yeah so yeah you were a kid when i was a teenager and a young adult being stupid and ignorant and yeah i mean i just i grew up in texas and in kansas and mostly and um was influenced by my surroundings and I was never, my, I was not raised in like a racist family by any means. And this isn't, this, this, this stupid ignorant thing that I used to say is uh, something that I just got from my peers around me and so the society around me. It wasn't something I was right. at home at all. Yeah. But I used to say that, you know, there were black people then and there were, you know what I mean? I used right, to say right, that right. stupid ignorant shit. And thank God I could never have posted that on the internet because I do not think that now. And I realized it was ignorant and stupid. And I learned that it was ignorant and stupid by meeting new people and going to different places and being like, oh, that was stupid. You know? Right. Well, I remember, well, it's, you know, it's like none of us are born like woke and none of us are born like racist, you know? So it's a matter of, kind of slowly changing the culture because I remember you know growing up and being like homophobic and then little did I know like way later down the line that I would be like kind of coming out in my own queer identity Mm -hmm. and then like just then seeing that behavior play out and just being like you know that wasn't really how I felt I was just repeating what was acceptable this is how you make fun of another boy you Mm -hmm. call him gay you know and then come around high school time, I'm like, man, I really like my uh, my friend over there. Yeah. <laughs> what are these feelings? And then, like, um, being able to go through that process, you Did know? You coming out in high school when you were in high school? Yeah. I, I mean, I was kind of, like, pushed out a bit. Um, so I wasn't ready. My plan was to come out in uh, college. But some people found out, and I was just like, you know what? It's time. And like, it was, it was around that time when people started coming out in high school. And like nowadays I feel like kids are even coming out in middle school. Elementary even. Yeah. Wow. I've seen it. Um, yeah. And that's, well, it's, that's it's, exactly it's cool. Kansas, you know? Yeah. Right. My, uh, my youngest child is uh, non-binary and their girlfriend is trans 
and they had a lot of friends that were varying different gender and sexual identities and um and then I wouldn't say I never really said anything that they were just people did not come out in high school mm -hmm. um when I was in high school uh they there definitely were gay kids in high school obviously but there was nobody out and proud not one in either high school I went to and um yeah, it just didn't, it just didn't, didn't happen. So I wasn't around queer people. They weren't, they just weren't around in my social circle. They weren't in my family. I just, so it, I, I didn't have, I certainly didn't have any sort of negative opinion on any of them. I knew a couple gay men that my mom worked with at Target and I always thought they were so fun and I liked them a lot. So I never had a problem. I don't remember, I just didn't think about them at all. You know, they just weren't a part of my life, and I never put any thought into queer people, whether they were right. or bad. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was raised Pentecostal, so you hear those old, like my grandparents say that they were going to hell and stuff, and I knew that wasn't right. Yeah. I didn't put a lot of thought into it or really care about their plight or their history or anything, because um, I was like not, I had no inkling of being queer until until I slept with a woman mm. like I, I I really had I didn't look at girls like that I didn't get crushes on girls I didn't have any of those feelings sexual or otherwise for anyone but boys and I was boy crazy as they would call the girls mm -hmm. and so um yeah and then and then I just the summer after high school I just slept with a woman and was like oh i like that it's pretty cool yeah um <laughs> but yeah <laughs> i mean i call my i call everything like my sexuality my gender i just say it's murky that's my new yeah, i identify yeah. as murky i don't because i'm i can't really identify necessarily as bisexual i mean i guess i can because i don't have relationships with women i don't mm -hmm. fall in love with them I mean, I'm not saying it's out, out of the question, but I've, it's never happened. Um, I don't get crushes on women like that, really. I don't. Right. Yeah. You're not waiting. You're not waiting by the phone for that text back. Like, no. oh God, I want them to just come on, just respond. Like me. I don't feel like me. No, I'm not really worried about women. Like yeah. Today. And so I only, so then my kid, you know, there's a lot of terms that the, the young Gen Z is making. They, mm -hmm. And it may have even been before them. I just hadn't heard it, but it's uh, hetero romantic. Mm, okay. Because There's a I, lot of terms, yeah. and I don't mind adding more terms to my life because you know I feel like as humans we're very capable of holding a lot of information. Yeah. So it's like okay, cool. If that's like if that's how it's described, I'm willing to consider it. And I feel like it keeps me young, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Well, when I find a term that so describes me so well and can easily and quickly explain to people, I like it. So I'm like, oh, heteroromantic, that makes sense. You can Google that and learn something about me. But, you know, there's like when I'm with a, in a committed relationship with a man, there's some men I've dated that are okay with me having sex with women since it's completely just sex and some aren't. And if they aren't okay with it, then I don't do it. And it's like, whatever. It's never something I'm seeking out anyway, but sometimes it's offered to me and it happens. And so, you know, they'd be okay, somewhere okay with it. And then one guy I dated last year for like a month or so said he was okay with it. He just said, as long as they don't have a penis. <laughs> and I was like, that's not going to work because I was married to and had a boyfriend before that that was a trans man and they did not have penises but i was in love with them did you go away would you change it where'd you go where'd you go your internet where did you go 
I don't know. I don't know what happens if I hit stop recording. Shit. Maybe hit, do I have a notification? Am I at some sort of maximum? No. What happened? Damn it, now I'm going to have to edit this part out. I'm going to have to edit that part out. There you are. All right. Got you back. Almost. So sorry. Jeez. <laughs> It's just <laughs> these I, things. You're pouring your heart out. You're telling them about your history. And, <laughs> and that was probably a, the magical moment of the podcast, too. You know, that's. <laughs> it, I can get it back. It's fine. <laughs> okay. um, so the last, the last thing I heard was um, when you find a word that describes you, you kind of oh, enjoy wow. it or you grab onto it. Okay. When I find a word that describes me, I really like it because it makes it easier for me to explain myself to people. Because they can look up the word if they want to Google it. I'm just like, Google it, you know? Right. But, but the guy I dated last year for like a month said that it, it was okay if I slept with women. Sometimes people are okay. Sometimes they're not. Yeah. Um, and if they're not, I don't care. I don't worry about it. Because I don't, I don't try to date women or have sex with women. Like, if something happens and I meet someone and something happens, it happens. But if I am in a relationship with someone who does not, who sees that as cheating, um, mm. then I don't do it. And right. if they don't see it as cheating and I feel like I want to, I do. And he didn't care if I did, but he said, just don't, as long as they don't have a penis. And I was like, that doesn't work because my ex-husband and an ex-boyfriend who I did love those people, they are trans. And so it's not about genitalia or what they have there. I am attracted to men people mm -hmm. i'm also attracted to people that are like androgynous yeah um but but they're still masculine you know what i mean so i'm attracted right. to, to and my brother has a joke uh where he's like i'm attracted to femininity you know and so yeah i'm attracted to i don't know i'm I, I fall in love with men and it, they can be trans men or cis men or whatever but they I don't fall in love with women. And um, so I was like, so I can't, so you can't just say, I can't just sleep with somebody that's a trans man because I could, I could develop emotional feelings for them. So it was like, I, I can't sleep, either I can sleep with women. It, I mean, it's pretty simple. You wouldn't let me sleep with women. But and right. I was like, and so I can, you know, so does that mean I can't sleep with a trans woman because she, if she still has her penis, because Right. I'm not going to fall in love with her because she's a freaking woman. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think like, yeah, it's, it's always more of a matter of like, everyone's getting the most recent updates. Like how I think of it is there's usually a breakdown when like the two people don't have the app, you know, metaphorically speaking that their apps aren't updated. Yeah. So like one person's trying to send something and it's like, Hey, did you update that it's okay for me to sleep with like multiple genders? And they're like, no, I still have the women only. And yeah. it's like, well, you got to update. Otherwise we're not going to communicate. You know? Yeah. It was mostly, he is a older guy, like 47. And so he, it was just a matter of him not understanding the language. You know what I mean? 
then right. he, he learned something in this situation. I was like, oh, that makes sense. You know, yeah. um, but we didn't work out for other reasons. Yeah, I I have, like, nothing against, like, philosophically against, like, you know, non-monogamy or polyamory or multiple relationships, but what concerns me is the, like, scheduling, you know? So it's like, I don't know if I would have the scheduling power to have several people at once, you know? I can barely do a podcast on time. I can barely do dishes. I can't imagine bringing in the, the emotional and, you know, physical space of a human. I don't have a lot of time. Me uh, neither. <laughs> in a normal in the normal world. Right. So if I am going on a date or spending time with somebody, unless we're doing it at a mic or a show, which is a lame date, um, not the date I want to go on with somebody when I'm trying to get to know them, you know, right. especially if they're not a comedian. Right. Um, well, and that's also kind of like your art space or your workspace yeah. too. So it's not totally like, it's not neutral, you know? No, it's not, because you're going to meet my friends, at least my mm-hmm. comedy friends. And what if you do something stupid and embarrassing in front of them? You know what I mean? Or start a fight. Oh, um, right. yeah. So, yeah, I don't want to bring them there. And so but that means, like, I am not going to a mic bare minimum. Mm-hmm. Um, I would never, I would never go on a date instead of being booked on a show, ever. Not ever. Not with anyone, ever. Right. So, um, but yeah, I, I definitely miss mics. And if there isn't a mic, there's also going to watch comedy. I like to go watch the comedians that are at a higher level than me. I like to support the alternative DIY comedy. I like to go and, um, or just, I gotta have time to just be high and be alone mm-hmm. in my apartment or in the mountain or somewhere, just hanging out, being stoned and just thinking. Yeah. I have time to do that. And so I don't have a lot of time. So I don't want to, um, I don't want to waste it. And I don't have time to deal with multiple people. Just trying to date, not even like meet in person date, but like just texting and messaging multiple people, especially like new people, like when I was dating online, I would forget whose backstory was whose. Like, I was on a date with a guy and I'd gone on a date the week before with a different guy and the new guy, I was like, I thought your dad was dead. He's like, no, my dad's not dead. And I was like, oh. and then in my head, I was like, oh <laughs> shit, that was that guy last week. Right, right, you know? right. right. <laughs> I mean, I have multiple best friends, but I don't talk to them. I talk to them fairly regularly and we keep up on each other's lives but not to the extent that I talk to somebody when I'm dating them. So I guess that might be a big difference is they don't, they're not as involved when you, cause when you think of a monogamous relationship, you get really involved in each other's life after a certain point. Right. Like you've been together long enough and yeah. maybe they aren't doing that part with every single person. Right. You know, they have different relationships with different people that have different rules. Mm-hmm. which sounds exhausting yeah i don't well, and it i think there's a time for it too you know because i think i don't like the prospect of that but i don't have that right now so i'm just enjoying it and then if it comes along then i'll enjoy that you know yeah but i feel like right now i can't really have anything that's taking away from my creative time because yeah. I just get bummed out when I'm not working on stuff, which is another thing about this quarantine that's been so hard is like, it's been a, like a lot to pull out creative stuff in myself, you know? In a perfect world, in my fantasy life. Yes, tell me your fantasy life. My partner brings out creativity in me and I like to be around them and I enjoy their company and you know, they are also creative and we can be creative together and creative apart. You know what I mean? So it's like, I, I want to be able to get my creative fix along with my love fix in yeah. an ideal world. Right, right, right. Well, I mean, you just putting that out into the universe, that's that's a good start, you know? But, well, I, I'm so leery about dating a comedian. Yeah. 
so fucking weary. I don't. Right, because then they're going to put their puppet in and they're going to have their guitar and they're going <laughs> to have a line. Um, a guitar is not a problem. Like, I like people that sing and play those comedians. Yeah. I, I, I think it's amazing. I wish I had. But, yeah. Know, what about a TikToker? Maybe you should go get a TikToker. I'm not even on TikTok, man. I'm too old. I'm 42. <laughs> I'm not going to get a TikToker. Yeah. Okay. This is how it. This is how it, maybe we should both be doing this. Is like we can like date people who are in comedy but are doing different mediums. You know. I just don't want to have to worry about drama fallout. I get petty, and it's not even that I'm worried about them. It's like me and my behavior. I don't want them to set me off in my work environment and, and that to be a story that the comedians are talking about. Yeah. I don't, if, if comedians are talking about me, I want them talking about me because I'm funny, because I'm doing this nonprofit, because I run the 5080 site. I, I don't want them talking about me because I, I cried at an open mic when Billy hurt my feelings. I don't want them talking about me because he's running around talking his mouth and then I have to defend things. And, I, I don't want to. Yeah. I don't want to deal with the fallout that could happen if it doesn't work out and it goes bad. And, right. um, and yeah. just, you know that that kind of chaotic energy needs to be contained if it is going to be pursued. Like it needs to be in some sort of like a short or a bit or something. It like to let that really run loose I mean, would well, just what's gonna hurt happen everybody. Going to write material about each other, right? And uh. he's going to know my buttons. And he's going to get up in a mic and he's going to retaliate with his material against the material I wrote. And it's going to hurt my feelings and I'm going to get upset. Yeah. And it could be that I just leave and cry in my car, hopefully. And I maintain, but it depends on my mood that day. And if, you know what I mean? How mm -hmm. raw I am that day. And if I'm really raw that day, whether it be about him or something else, I could fucking verbally lash out like fuck you like yeah. heckle him i don't know what i would do because i get upset and sometimes when i get mad i lose all reason of i'm not violent or anything but i lose all sense of self-preservation like i will i got mad at a, a guy that fucked me over fixing my car in joliet illinois who was like a cholo dude who it turns out i didn't know but he had a gun in his waistband and I am in this fucker's face and I am calling him every fucking name there is. And I'm going off on him. He was just laughing at me. <sighs> Look at this fucking white lady is what he said in Spanish. Um, I know a little, I know, I know what the cuss words are. And, um, but while it was happening, like afterwards, when, when the boyfriend I had at the time was like, he took, they went on the test drive. And he was trying to sell, the, the mechanic guy was trying to sell him drugs. And when he went into his pocket for something, he saw the gun. It's not like the guy showed him his gun. And I am just flipping out on this guy and um, not think, like in his face. I mean, we had a car door between us, but I was in his face. And I was just screaming at him and doing the finger. And um, So Andy, it was a small car and Andy was a very tall guy with long arms, reached into the passengers, over the passenger seat, pulled me into the car and took off with the door partially open, like, get the fuck in here. What are you doing? And so uh -oh. I'm still going off and I'm still going off and he starts yelling at me about the gun and stuff. And I was like, Oh, <laughs> right. Right. Hmm, so maybe the best idea. Right, right. So the rage you can, you can tap into that rage fairly easily. Not fairly easily. No, but you're not afraid to go there, I guess. But it, yeah. And when it's somebody that I've been in love with, especially if they wronged me or, or something like that and they're doing something that I feel is going to damage my reputation and then yeah I don't want to deal with any of that bullshit yeah I because I've seen it happen in comedy mm. scenes and right. after, I did fuck up and sleep with one person in the comedy scene and now I'm still it was it was a little dramatic for a minute but nobody really knew about it I had some really good jokes it worked because more people liked me than him and he's not he's like an open micer. He's not, you know what I mean? Any, anybody in the scene that anybody respects or, you know what I mean? Right. And so it didn't really matter, but um, it was mostly, I just did jokes about him and then people wanted to know what the joke was about because it's a joke about a Mexican guy. And they were kept saying that it was this other guy. And I was like, basically I named who it was just so I could, I didn't want it to be that guy. You know what I mean? Like, right, no, right, right. 
Right. <laughs> it was like Carlos. People were, I was like, yeah, no, it's not Carlos. Like, oh, yeah. my God. Yeah. No, I don't want to say their real names. It wasn't Carlos, but um, yeah. everyone knows who it is. Right. Who it is. I, I just had they know what they did. <laughs> well, I, I'm still friends with him. He called me. I had a conversation with him for like three and a half hours, right? Mm -hmm. And there's this other comedian that we both know, and I have a crush on the guy. And we were talking about that guy, and he was guessing who they were based on how I was describing them. And he guessed that one, and he was like, well, he asked me once. First of all, when we were dating or whatever, the guy I have a crush on was like, you shouldn't be dating her. And then the guy I was dating is an idiot. So he couldn't really verbally explain anything to me or he was trying to hide something. He basically just said it came off to him. Like he, like the, my crush liked me and he didn't like us dating because he didn't think we would be good together. I don't know. And then um, later on the crush was like, I think she's hitting on me. And the ex told him, I don't know, man but she gives really good blowjobs. And I was like, God damn it, Brian, fine, I'll say it. Why would you say that? Like, God damn it. I don't, that's the kind of shit I don't want being right. talked about. I don't want men hanging out, talking about me and my sex, like with them. Yeah. And they're bros because I am friends with their friends. Right. And, and people do that. I talk, I'm not saying that I don't do it. I do, I talk, I do shit to my girlfriends in great detail of my sex life mm. and men's penises and all sorts of stuff. I'm not saying it's wrong to do that with your friends. I'm just, right. saying, I don't want it to be me amongst the, uh, like there, there, there's five guys out there and they're all talking about how good I suck dick. And then I come out to hit, smoke some weed with them. And they're all like, Oh, those looks good dick. And they're thinking that, and I don't even know it. Now I have to right. have policy told that too. Yeah. And they're thinking about how good I suck dick when I eat my banana. You know? Right. Yeah. It's yeah. a good point. So, well, that's just about dating the right. Not all guy comedians are like that and aren't gross. So. Right. Well, yeah. And yeah, it's, yeah, it might just be too close because it is, it is this weird dynamic where it is like your public life and anyone can go to a comedy show. But since it is like your work and they're kind of your coworkers, but then there's also that other dynamic of like, yeah, just, being too open and having too much out there because you know i i kind of like go back and forth with that of how much do i want out in the world and how much do i should i keep you know i'll get on stage and make jokes about being a good dick sucker if i want to i don't have any but i i mean i could i could write jokes about that and i don't have a problem doing that but um i'll say anything in a joke and i'm very honest and open in my jokes about all sorts of stuff but yeah, just the, the water cooler, you know, locker room talk about me is, is not something I want being done. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I also have a similar kind of idea of like, you know, maybe I would meet someone and we could be like making films together, you mm -hmm. know, and we could have this like creative romantic partnership. Cause I have seen that play out like in real life with people, you know? Yeah. Um, but then I'm just like, could that work? I mean, you know, would we both be kind of control freaks about it? Like, and um, yeah, but I haven't found anyone yet. But I'm also not actively looking. I don't have any dating apps. I, I uh, yeah, I got rid of the apps. Um, and then I got them back during the quarantine because I was just so bored. And I thought maybe there actually be people on there that want to talk to me and get to know me and not just smash. But no, mm, it's worse. You know. It's way worse. If I had a superpower, it's developing a crush on people who are in relationships. <laughs> and not like, and it's always like right before, like the crush has happened and then I find out they're seeing someone. It's not like yeah. I'm attracted to people in relationships. Yeah. It's like, it's this sixth sense I have where I'm like, you seem really great. Are you my soulmate? I don't know if it's like, because maybe I watched too many romantic comedies growing up and I think I need to like, chase them in the airport at some point or yeah no i i have done that but i when i find out they're in a relationship i'm immediately over it i'm like uh mm -hmm. um kind of i guess not everyone but um it's rare but crushes are all i do now what i do 
is I have a crush on somebody and then, you know, the comedians always put out a lot of content on the internet. So you can learn all sorts of information about them, you know? So I kind of like internet stalk them a little, listen to podcasts they've been on. Mm, um, nice. You know, when the world is going, I see them at mics. I pay attention when they're doing their comedy. Right. I, this is a full reconnaissance mission. <laughs> I, I, I don't like follow them around by any means, but if they're in the circle of friends that I am in, I will try to pay attention to what they're saying. Yeah. Um, so wait, do you like tell them that you heard their episode or anything? I, or you just kind of keep it quiet? I have told one person that I've heard their episode. Mm-hmm. Um, and I actually was really high while I was listening to their episode. So I was commenting to them as I listened to it. Mm. Um, Which should have been a real good clue for them. Was kind of like, they should know I like them. And I don't think they like me because they weren't like, they were okay. They were communicating back and forth to me. I don't know. That's another thing about comedy comedians is they're all so fucking, they're all so, so just like socially awkward. And then rightfully so, male comedians are very, are getting to where they're just going to go ahead and assume that every female comedian that's nice to them just wants to be their friend unless they're told blatantly otherwise. You know, cause they don't, they don't want to assume that a chick is into them and she's just being nice. And then they yeah. get sort of rep as being a creep by accident. You know what I mean? Like, right, right. So, yeah. which is, which is a good thing. It's good that they, that I want them to just go ahead and assume that. Yeah. I'm really mindful of that too. I always make sure to just be like, um, that there is like a level of professionalism yeah. that is, that's the starting point. It's not an afterthought, you know? Yeah. But I'm still like, in, I'm just investigating at this point, you know? And, um, maybe if they're on a show that is a show I want to, I mean, I won't go to a show just because they're on the show. That's creepy. But if, you know, I'm trying to decide between two shows and I can't decide and they're on one, I'll go to it. There's a lot of shows to go to. And so, um, yeah. And a lot of the same comedians kind of go to the same mics um, that I go to. You know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. comedians have their mics that they like and they, there's certain mics that like a lot, almost all the comedians go to. So I'll see them at those mics and stuff. Most of the stalking is done, investigating is done online, but then uh, inevitably something will happen. Um, I'll find out they have a girlfriend or they'll say something really stupid, uh, while we're hanging out outside getting high or their bro will say their bro could say something really ignorant and sexist and stupid and if they laugh too hard at it mm. i'm out you know yeah and so i'm like i'm like i've 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 dated and broken up with several comedians that have no idea <laughs> right right, right. <laughs> they don't even know. yeah they don't even yeah. know um so that's what i do now i just like investigate and then i very it's a it's a slow process it can be months and months of investigating before and i never something happens and I don't ever meet the mood. Hmm. Sometimes they get a girlfriend and I'm too late. And, um, and I don't know, I have, and the thing is like, I have no clue if any of these dudes even want to have sex with me. I have no clue, um, how they think of me at all. Right. Well, so me and my friend actually came up with this idea for a service where it would be basically, like a neutral messaging service where the person is approached and says like, Hey, um, just so you know, like Matt has a crush on you. Will you please fill out this form? And it could be like, yes, no, maybe, you know, like middle school. (laughs) Yep. That's basically what we're recreating. I don't want no maybe. I want yes or no. Okay. What? But I we can't be binary anymore. I thought we were like getting away from the binary. Maybe it just makes me more stressed out. I want to right. be <laughs> But you know, it would be a neutral party that's not connected, you know? And they get to send that person over. So it's a little less um confrontational for people like me who are cowards, I think is what <laughs> And it's not that I'm a coward um, when it comes to regular men that aren't comedians or in the comedian. You don't even have to be a comedian. Just in the comedian sphere, you're in the 
comedian sphere. You know what I mean? You're in mm -hmm. the, you know, a lot of the comedians. So if you're even in the sphere like that, there's a lot of, I don't want to be hitting and asking out everybody that I get a crush on. Because I currently right. have a crush on like five dudes. I'm not yeah. just going to ask out five fucking guys that are all in the same circle. Right. It's like every time you like apply to see your credit score, it like gets dinged a bit, you know, like yeah. you can only check your credit store like score like once a year, you know? Yeah. So I, I do a lot of pre-planning and investigating to see if they're, and it's to see if they are somebody I want to risk asking out and being rejected by, you know what I mean? Like I want to, yeah. I want to see if it's worth the risk. I've asked out one comedian. He did decline because he just started dating a lady. And I mm -hmm. still have a crush on him and would, would worship him. He knows who he is. Um, but I don't know if they're still together. I don't know if they have a relation. I don't know what's up with him when it comes to relationships or whatever. I had no idea he was dating anybody, but he doesn't put that all out there like that. So um, he hasn't reached back out to me if he got single. So I'm not really worried about it. But um, what was my point? Oh, that you're not a coward? I asked him out, but I have been, I had a crush on him since before I started comedy. Mm, okay. I call him at High Plains. Mm. I was reaching a little, I feel like if comedian the comedian, I was reaching real high. Like he's way above me comedically. Mm. But like person to person, I didn't feel like he was like out of my league or anything, but like as a comedian, yeah. So, um, but he was worth asking out. I, 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 seen him do comedy multiple times i've heard people talk about him i've heard him on so many podcasts you know i i yeah, spent time with him at, at, at a festival amongst other comedians but um yeah so i'd investigated really thoroughly before i asked him out and he declined very nicely and i've seen him since and it hasn't been weird but um that's always nice i i love a good it's not weird afterwards you know that's that's to me is a win I mean, and then, like, the guy that I dated, the only reason, yeah, the guy I dated, the only reason that was a comedian, the only reason there was any animosity at all was because I felt like he had manipulated me into sex, because we hung out, and he said that he wanted the same things I did, and all this stuff, and, I mean, we're taking it slow, but then he said he had a black heart, and he didn't know if he'd ever love again, I was like, why are you dating me? Um, if that's never going to be an option or, you know what I mean? If you're not in a place, you're not, if that's the truth, which I understand how that happens, I get it. And you shouldn't be dating somebody that wants something serious. You should be out dating people that want casual things or not dating at all. Right. <laughs> and, um, yeah. You're not, you're not really here to play. So why are you on the court? You know? Yeah. And so I feel kind of manipulated, but at the same time, he's a fucking idiot. So maybe he didn't really mean to manipulate me. Mm -hmm. It's just not very smart. And he's not yeah. funny. It's terrible. He thinks he's funny, though. I think, like, since I've been working on, like, different shows for a couple years, my mind has now become wired to think of things in terms of shows. So hear me out. Here's my pitch, okay? We could call it Love Out Loud, LOL, and it will be just a reality comedy show. And it's just, you know, we follow people comics who have crushes on other comedian people you know we could be in it you know show both our work and our quest for love maybe yeah hulu maybe hulu would take it maybe for like <laughs> shows <laughs> but it's a it's a lot of me just looking at shit online mm -hmm. <laughs> um scrolling i also i feel things. like also i need to meet someone who like spiritually too like connects to me and also oh. like I don't know if I could be with someone completely straight laced and like grounded because I am a dreamer to a yeah. large extent you know but yeah. maybe I do need someone who's like doing their taxes on time or something you know well I have I am both those people I am I am an organized person who does her taxes on time and keeps track of her personal finances in a software program mm, smart. Um, and does her cash flow review to see if she's going to be poor and needs to figure out when to make more money mm -hmm. that's what I, I have all my bills and expenses in the software and when I can project it out 90 days or a year or whatever and be like oh man in August I'm gonna have to figure something out 
Um, mm. And then I do, but uh, I'm also not that responsible with my money. I will, mm. I, I fuck myself frequently mm-hmm. and then have to figure it out. Um, but it, I'm, so I'm fairly responsible. Um, yeah. I'm also like a dreamer and creative and. Right. You have like those two spirits inside you. I do. And, but That's my, cool. My crea- I think my organizational stuff is not necessarily so obnoxious that it's, it feels, um, like a down or like burdensome because like, I know those kind of people they're too they're too realistic they're too they don't dream at all and it's they're I mean because I can definitely find the downside to a right. situation but you know there's people that are there's people that are just too scared to take a risk is what it is mm-hmm. like my mother who worked for Target for 30 years because she she had dreams and aspirations, but she valued the stability of that job she hated more right. than, you know, she wasn't willing to take the risk of losing that stability on something that might not work out. And so that's why I like creative people because they generally have this creative outlet that makes them take risks for it. Right. Which is what I well, And I think that's the cool part about like kind of modern day living. Cause I think for a long time, playing it safe was kind of the only way. Mm -hmm. And now with like the internet, there's like so much more opportunity. Like I remember I visited my friend at like the co-working space he was at and he was trying to do like comedy, but he did like finance as his day job. And next to him, there was a dude who made custom puzzles for people. And that was like his job. And it's like the internet has allowed it. So that way, if you want to do that with your life and make a living, you can, it's really just a matter of finding like people that are interested, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a, there's an Island off in Ireland that like wants to pay Americans to go there and help them relocate. And, uh, if I had, and, and, and Dublin's only like four hours away. Sure, you have to ride like a little boat and then drive or whatever, but it's possible. And Dublin has a decent comedy scene. I was like, but I would have to have a means of income that was online. So, or I could just right. go live in Dublin. Mm-hmm. Right. I thought about it. I was like, I am at least going to go, I'm at least going to go to Dublin for like a month. Yeah. Like a long time. I, I don't want to just go for a week for a vacation. I want to go. And I want to explore and I want to soak myself in the city and, mm-hmm. and see how I feel about it. Because that's how I moved to Denver before I started comedy. Me and the kids went out there. We were there for like 10 days and my little brother. And we did a vacation, but I was like, I just fell in love with Denver. And I was like, I want to be in Denver. Um, and then I started comedy and had, you know, I got to be in Denver. It's the best place for me to be. Right, right. But I don't know. I don't like America. Yeah. Do you like, I don't know if Dublin, what are you, do you, do you have any kind of a uh, projections for what's going to happen in this next election thing or? Oh God. Or you don't want to talk about it? <laughs> Trump's going to win. I okay. Think, I don't think there's anything we can do about it. Just right. from a statistical standpoint of presidents get reelected. Yeah. He's got that. Um, and there are a lot of people that don't want Biden that are on the fence that are more independent people that aren't necessarily Trump supporters that are in the group of people protesting and wanting our government to open, but they're not Trump supporters because I lost some Facebook friends because of it. People I would never have thought were going to be the kind of people to be out there protesting when I talk shit on people protesting, defended the protesters, and then unfriended me. So I was Uh, like, it's not just, I mean, we see the pictures of Trump supporters, but it's not just Trump supporters that are out there. But these people, they they wanted, um, they they were on the fence anyway, and Mm. and they're going to go to his side because they don't want Biden, and they don't want the Democrats, and the fucking propaganda of Democrats is is working on them and that's how Mm -hmm. they feel too 
That it's not yeah. that it's working on them, and they made the Republicans made them think anything. But when the Republicans said that stuff, they were like, "That's how I feel," and none of the Democrats feel that way. And I'm saying, you know what I mean? So he's going to get those people. Um, plus, you know, there's going to be people like me that vote for Daisy Duck. Yeah. I'm not. Well, it's between I, Biden and Daisy Duck. I don't know how I'm going to vote till I go in there. I really don't. Right. I have no fucking clue how I'm going to vote, but I I feel very strongly. If Trump loses, I will be shocked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm like, I, I'm totally on the same page with you that there's only a handful of one term presidents, and I don't think that's a coincidence. And they're most and, of them over for the last hundred years. In the last hundred right. years, they're really. Yeah. And but, one of them was just a replacement for a president that died. So he doesn't really care. Right. Yeah. Well, and then George H.W. Bush was like vice president before too. So, and yeah. he just has had his hand and it's not like a one hit wonder. Like with presidents, I don't think there's like one hit, like yeah. wonders that at least are That's as famous away. as Trump, you know, Trump's like. Going away. Trump's yeah. going away. Trump's away. He, he might not even leave after a second term. Like that's no, like the no, no, scarier he's part. No, going out of this, the political sphere. He's yeah. still going to be in there. They're all, if they're alive, they're still in there. You still hear what they think and how they feel about everything. Right. They, they interview them. Yeah. And well, like, what I think too is like, I kind of like, I mean, of course I want Trump out and I'll probably vote for Biden, but I'm still like on the fence too, because I'm still like this allegation thing changes a new light. I also haven't given hope on Sanders. And I think like, maybe like, you know, I don't know if Warren is somehow playing a big role that could change things. But I feel like karmically, the United States is not ready for Trump to leave because we have so much like, baggage and we have so much kind of blood on our hands that I would be shocked if he were to be, um, if he weren't reelected re again too, you know, like karmically, we have a lot, we have a lot to answer to. And I think the only way we're going to answer is if we keep bottoming out, you know, I think that some people are like, we got to open it. You what? You want the whole economy to collapse? I'm like, yeah, let it fucking collapse. The only way we're going to rebuild it. This I fucked up and watched the documentary, Oliver Stone's The Truth of America or The Truth of the United States or something like, The Untold Story of the United States, I think is what it's called. Anyway, we've been fucked since the beginning, man. We've been mm -hmm. fucked since the day this country was started. It's been started by rich old white guys trying to be in power and that's still what it is. And it, it's always been fucked. So how can we fix it? We have to just mm -hmm. tear it down and build a new fucking house. You know, it's not, this house was not built with the right foundation. Right. And, and, the, and the machine that we have, which we've just seen, can't take two weeks off. It needs to always be going, you know? Yeah. So it's like, uh, maybe we should design a better machine. <laughs> That's a dangerous position to be in. It's like when you have an employee that knows how to do a job and you don't know how to do it and you right. can't fire them. You know you can't fire them because they're the only ones that can do that job. Yeah. And there's no, there's no manual, you know, I've seen many companies get themselves in that position. Mm -hmm. Many, many companies. And, uh, it's a dangerous position to be in. You have no power. Yeah. Right. No power. They don't want, it's about power and it's about money. Yeah. And there's a lot of people in this country that also just regular citizens that are driven by power and money as well, though. So those people have mm. to go somewhere. They're not going to go away. Um, the people driven by power and money are going to want, I think we need less united. Mm. Yeah. But not that we need to be 50 separate countries. Right. But I think that this whole mm. idea of one United States where everybody lives under all the same rules and laws is unrealistic because there's too many different people here for everybody to be satisfied. Um, mm. And these people that believe, I know there's a lot of kooky people that believe um, that are anti-abortion and stuff, but I was religious. I was never as anti-abortion as they were, but I was friends with them. They truly believe that you are killing a baby. If you truly believed that that building over there was slaughtering babies, wouldn't you be outraged and want to do something about it? And there's right. nothing that's going to happen to change your mind. You believe they are killing babies in that office. 
And so uh, you can't change their mind. Right. But let them go over there, you know? Yeah. They can be well, over there. Yeah. I mean, that's like why it's so hard to communicate is because a lot of the times we're, we're not even talking to each other, like in the same reality. Like I saw that they just put that woman in Dallas uh, who opened up her salon for a week. They just gave her seven days in jail and fined her. And they like had footage of her like ripping up a cease and desist letter about her keeping her salon open. And it's like, when I saw her ripping it up, I was like, I know that this is just a symbol that she's just ripping up a symbol and all of her like fans are like loving that she's standing up to the symbol, mm -hmm. but it's like, just keep your salon open or closed for another week, please. Well, just stand for the flag. Cause that's how we want to believe. Right. It's not, it just, even if you don't believe it, just stand up there and quit making trouble. Yeah. You know? I like the people who are like, they're like, well, couldn't you protest at a more convenient time, not during the national anthem? And it's like, protests are supposed to be inconvenient. Yeah. <laughs> if a protest is convenient, it's ineffective. Like, it needs yeah. to, like, clog the system. <laughs> but I'm, I've always been so unbelievably poor most of my life. Same. That that's what the economy collapsing do you want the economy to collapse and everybody to be poor? I'm like, right. I've always been poor. <laughs> right. I, you know what? What fucking difference is it going to make? Yeah, and it's not going to. It's not going to have that huge of an impact because you get these people that get these good jobs and nobody owns anything. They don't mm. own their house. They don't own those jet skis. They don't own those cars. They got fucking monthly payments for them and they built their life up with this income level and they require that income level to continue that fucking life full of material things. But that's what brings them joy and happiness. That's what, for me, I was filling a hole with material things that needed to be filled by comedy. But there are people that legit are just really happy when they see a lot of money in their bank account. Mm -hmm. um, and that drives them to do things. Right. Those people can go somewhere. Yeah. The thing no, is, it's like the Venn diagram people that go into more categories, you know, like capital people that like capitalism, but also aren't, you know, anti-abortion. <laughs> right. I thought of putting up something the other day of like, and I didn't because I'm, I am, I am kind of afraid of getting in trouble online because yeah. if people can't hear my voice or hear my like tone, I, I think sometimes they don't know I'm joking. Yeah. yeah but I was thinking yeah. like. Everyone who's an anti-capitalist should try starting a business and everyone who is pro-capitalist should work minimum wage and let's do that for a year and then we'll come back and regroup, you know? No, and I've done all those things. I've started yeah. businesses and I've, um, I know how much red tape there is. I helped my friend open his bar. That's a lot of red tape. Um, right. With her license and stuff. You know, and then yeah. I see the trouble that, you know, like Megan is going through with wide right. And um, that's really a city issue. Mm -hmm. um, but where was I going with that? Ah, I do that. I get lost in my own fucking conversation. Yeah, hey, and happens. I've worked for minimum wage and been poor. So I've done, I've right. done both. It's not that fucking hard to start a business. Yeah. I mean, the city of Denver and the liquor license thing is like a whole, like, Colorado in general, their tax setup, like sales and use tax, is so because you can cross the street and it can be a different thing. And they got all these little things and just these little areas that have been voted on and added on, and it gets changed twice a year. And so, yeah. like, because I used to do that for my job, a big part of the job I had for two years when I lived there was doing the sales and use tax for a construction company. And so, um, it is so complicated. And it is a little overly complicated there. The tax right. is way overly complicated. The fucking system you have to go through to get a liquor license and to do these things is really overcomplicated. Um, yeah, there's there's too much complication. But that right. doesn't mean you have to just get rid of all the regulations. You know. Right. Right. Yeah. But it takes too much time to systematically go through and tweak things, blah, blah, blah. And then that's the problem, too, with, like, elections. You get, like, a city council in there with the people that are in charge. They're 
you know, they're all about making it easier, but it takes so long to get in, not even in a government, even in a private institution to get that many employees to shift from one plan to the other. It takes so fucking long that by the time you get it going, any, any symbionts of order, there's new people in control and they change everything all over again. The management yeah. is changing to is changing so frequently. So we either need to take the, take the controls of those decisions out of people's hands that are going to be coming in and out of the system or keep people longer in the system. I guess I don't really, I'm not really for longer term limits. There are, you know, the city councils even have term limits. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. know. Yeah. But, but it's an elected position. Right. Instead of a hired position, it should still be a government position, but some of these positions should be, I think the people making plans for this for, for our schools, mm -hmm. school board members can be anybody. They can be you. They can be me. They can be anybody that can get enough votes to be on the school board. They know nothing. They aren't educators. They aren't they were real estate agents, you know? They know nothing. They have no business being on a school board, but they get on the school board so that they can then maybe get elected for city council to maybe get elected for this. But they don't really give a shit about the school board. The school board should be people that have been hired to make these high level important decisions that affect schools. Or they should bare minimum have to have been an educator. They, we need to figure out like a pool where these people have to come from and pick people because there's, there's educators on both sides. And also, right. it, it should be a job. It shouldn't be a political party. It shouldn't yeah. be, you know what I mean? There shouldn't, it shouldn't matter whether you're a Democrat or Republican. You're, you have a job as the school board or the right. city council. It should be. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I, I think like, I think that's, that's interesting. Like use like starting businesses and knowing that end. Is that like kind of what led you more to go towards a nonprofit kind of model or? Do you just think that's the easiest way or the most ethical way? Do, for what I'm trying to do, nonprofit's really the only way. I'm mm -hmm. not, I'm not, I don't have a product to sell. I, I don't have, I'm just trying to help people. Um, yeah. And so, oh, sorry. I got to message my kid one second. It's okay. I just, I just want to help people and I love comedy. Right, right. Um, and nonprofits, there's been so there's been a lot of steps to the nonprofit. I have to have a board, um, and there's bylaws, and there's meetings, and you know there's gonna be there has to be an annual meeting, and there's things that have to be filed. It's 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 not a whole lot different from a regular small business, other than I'm nonprofit. But the running of it is and starting up of it is is much like any other business. Um, right. it's just, they can deny me a nonprofit. They can say, no, we won't give you a license to be a nonprofit. Um, whereas if I started a business, they'd be like, here you go. You're a business. Um, it's like one more form, which is what I filed. And I'm, I, I mean, it's rare that they deny nonprofits and I've had someone helping me through it. That is, um, experienced with it. So. I feel pretty confident that we're going to get approved. I mean, we're technically already a business. We're an LLC, Art of Comedy LLC. So you have to do that part. And then you, you do the business part and then you do the nonprofit, which is like a, a form. Right. Yeah. Well, I think it's, I think it's a really great idea because it's just like, you know, it's like people need either like tools or they need space or they need education mm -hmm. and like, providing people like space and education is such a big gift and like even like i mean physical space like if you had a place to rehearse but more of like kind of like the emotional space right yeah. especially for comedy which has notoriously been like kind of cutthroat and is i i mean i feel like it's like in a lot of ways like art that there's a lot of ego there yeah and when there's a lot of ego involved in something like people get hurt you know yeah because people aren't their egos No, I, um, yeah, but I don't have a lot of ego about comedy. I really love comedy and I love doing it, but I don't think I'm going to be some sort of famous. I don't see more good comedians coming into the scene 
as a threat in any way to me mm. and my comedy. Um, because there's only one me. Right, and yeah. I'm not really worried about it, especially more females and queer comics and stuff. I, I, I see it doing nothing but good for a comedy scene. So I don't have, I, I don't get upset when friends get good and you know, get on festivals. I didn't do anything. I'm like, you know, but I produced a festival. I understand what's going behind the scenes trying to, yeah. it's not that like they're putting all their friends on there, but if I had to pick between somebody I know personally as a good person off stage and a, a wild card that I don't know, I, and they're both just as funny, I'm going to go with somebody who I actually know their reputation. Mm -hmm. um, maybe that other person was just good on that one tape that one time. That's happened. Like, who's, okay. this, who's this person on my stage? That is not who was on that tape. You know, <laughs> right? Yeah. No, I mean, and that's like, I feel like, I don't know how to incorporate that, but I feel like um, having people kind of like consider how their ego is playing in the things would be like a cool thing, you know, because I feel like a lot of people aren't in that state of being able to just look at it as it is. And people get like threatened when someone gets a success thing, you know, and like, that stuff just gets in the way. It really does. Yeah, I don't, I think you have to have a certain amount of narcissism, ego, mania to be a comic, mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, it's part right. of what drives most, a lot of comics, including myself, obviously. And so, but I think that the comics that I like the most are, if, if a comic, I don't care how funny they are on stage, um, and this goes for local comics all the way up to everything. I don't care how good their material is. I don't care how good they are at writing a joke. I don't care how funny they are on stage. If off stage they're a piece of shit, I'm not going to be a fan. I'm not going to support their comedy. I'm not going to do it if I don't like who they are as a person. And they're, you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm not going to do it because I feel like by supporting their art, I'm supporting their their shitty personality. Right. Right. I'm not going to do it. Yeah. Align myself with pieces of shit. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, and like, I feel like too, like th that's like another gift the internet has given us where it's like, you know, you're going to be held accountable for something you put out, you know, and be being able to be like, Hey, I stand by this comic or I stand by this joke. It's only a benefit, you know? Yeah. And people get in trouble when they're like, Hey, why'd you do that? And they're like, Oh, I wasn't thinking or something, you know? Yeah. And it's like, well, you get, you should. <laughs> yeah, you have to think about what. There's a record doing. now. <laughs> yeah, everybody should be doing that, but much less, that's one reason why I don't want fame, is that I, I don't want to have to think that hard about every word that comes out of my mouth every time I want a podcast. Mm -hmm. I don't want to think about how a sound bite of something that I said, like the stuff when I was talking earlier about dating the guy, you could edit that audio, dating the guy that, the set up a date women and um, right. the trans men and who has penises and you know genocide, all that conversation right. could easily be edited in a way to make me sound like shit you just right. cut out certain parts of it yeah Put it together right. i sound like a transphobic <laughs> asshole <laughs> right. don't have like ellen Riker. <laughs> yeah and if you don't Drag have to the coals and that's yeah. what happens a lot it's like that's not what i said that's not the full audio of what i said right you know and so I don't want to think about that. Yeah. Well, I think like since everything's getting more niche in general, that the I the like definition of famous has even changed. Like I would say probably like Jay-Z and Beyonce are like or like Kanye West or something are like the last of like people across the board know them. But then you start getting into like Instagram and there'll be like one person who's well known for this one thing they do or this one kind of comedy, and then they'll walk into a room and no one knows who they are. And it's like, that's enough. If, if I could have that, if I could have enough of a following to make yeah. a living, that would be, I would when totally be content. Films, when you're like the director of a film, and <laughs> successful films, like I wouldn't know if Michael Bay walked into Walmart next to me. Right, right. I have no idea. I mean, some people will, a lot of people will, but I don't. Right, um, yeah. I know his movies, I know the name, but I can't, I can't even think of what he looks like right now. It would have to be like Steven Spielberg. I might recognize him, maybe. Mm -hmm. Um, because he's so famous, but I don't I don't know. I might just not even notice him because I'm 
shopping. You know what I mean? Um, so like the behind the scenes people, definitely people that write movies, all yeah. the people on that, you know, when you, when you read the credits in a movie, you don't know who any of those people are, but they could be very successful and right. famous <laughs> within their, the world of theater and or the world of film, you know, but the general population doesn't know who they are. Right. That was always a funny experience because I lived in New York for a bit and the coffee shop I worked at was in the West Village. So like there would be famous people that would come through just because it's such an expensive neighborhood to live in. Yeah. And it would be so funny because I would get excited when I saw somebody and then my coworker would be like, oh, I don't know who that is. Yeah. And then they would get excited. They're like, do you know who that is? Do you see this show? And I'm like, I haven't seen it. So when I'm working like taking their order they're just a normal person like, like that illusion of fame has been taken away and i'm just like it's a regular person who wants a coffee you know <laughs> yeah i think like i want to be friends with famous people i want to mm. know them but i don't want to be one of them i want to like i like new comedians i would love to build some careers or help them with their careers and be invited to their secret island wedding you know but nobody knows who i am and i have money there you go. Boom. Not okay, a lot so of we... money. Just enough money to live. I don't need a lot of money. I don't need a big yeah. house. I'm not right. saying I need a lot of money. I just want to have enough money to be mildly comfortable, which doesn't yeah. mean a lot because I've always been poor. Yeah. I've always been poor too, but recently I've started changing my relationship to money and I've been viewing it more like in a metaphorical way of like, understanding that since I've been doing freelance and since I do so much creative work that understanding that that money is just a representation of my creativity, you know, and I'm trying to like demonize it less and just know that they're kind of numbers in a computer screen at this point. But also I don't have like kids or a spouse or anything. So yeah, I can be well, a little I, bit more abstract. I can now because I don't pay for it, hardly any of their stuff. So nice. Boom. Well, and the, the cool part is too, you can make art of comedy that bigger yeah. thing and not you, you know? Yeah, no, it will definitely. Yeah. I want it to be, nobody's going to know if my, if my nonprofit blows up, no one's going to know who I am. Yeah. It'll be great. But I have to go. My kids are here. Speaking of children. All right. That's okay. I'm sorry. I was a bit late. So oh, thanks fine. for, well, thanks for schedule, adjusting. I had a schedule till six. So I usually, ends up being like an hour and a half and then if i have two back to back i have a break yeah i will talk to you later and hopefully see cool. you someday soon no totally and then yeah just send me the links for this and i'll also push it cool cool all right all right cool have a good day all right bye